Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's very nice to, uh, well, quote unquote, meet you. Um, I, I hope that, uh, that, you know, we, I mean, it'd be really nice if we could see each other with, uh, face to face, but, um, but, you know, it's, um, sometimes, you know, things do not happen like that. <clears throat> so today I'm going to tell you about, um, you know, what's the, what the particle physics is that actually pursues the fundamental understanding of the universe. And I'll tell you about that in my point of view. And then, you know, I'll tell you about what high throughput computing or even, you know, sometimes grid computing, cloud computing did for, you know, um, a high energy particle physics and why it's so important. But, uh, you know, most importantly, I was going to tell you about my 1000 year dreams and I'll tell you how I linked these, you know, with, uh, with 1000 year dreams. Okay. Uh, so for first, you know, well, there will be introduction and, you know, especially talking about what high energy particle physics is. And, and then I'll, I'll be followed by defining what the problem is that actually caused the, you know, solution in uh, computing grid. And then, and then I'll talk about, you know, some metrics that show the performance of the grid and, you know, what that grid did to everyday lives. And then we'll, I'll, I'll conclude it. Hang on a second. Let me just put, you know, one of these um, uh, screens that, uh, that I have your faces on it because, um, you know, right in front of me is the, is the screen that doesn't have anything like that. And that doesn't seem to be good. Let me just do this again. <clears throat> Sorry about this. I use Zoom all the time for... Um, <clears throat> for teaching. I actually had my first uh, practice class yesterday afternoon, so I know oh, uh, how it works. Huh? How many yeah. students so, do you have in your class now? 130. Yeah, that's, that's um, this is the first year in you know, electromagnetism class. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, so um, I always have a lot of students like that. Mm -hmm. That's why I can't go in. It has to be online yes. and synchronous. Mm -hmm. And we'll see how it works out. <clears throat> but in any case, so Katevi told me to uh, introduce myself, you know, a little bit, so I'll tell you about it. And, you know, basically, there is no difference between me and you. It's just that, you know, I'm 25 years old and you're maybe 29. Who knows? Okay, <laughs> so let me tell you who I am. First, my full name is Jaehun Yu. It's very hard to pronounce it by, you know, non-Korean people. So I, you know, short myself my name to J-U. So that it's much easier to do ever since I got here 30 years ago. I lived in South Korea through 1987. So I'm a, you know, a South Korean born American and, you know, under a military dictatorship. And <clears throat> I've never gone out of the military dictatorship until I left there. And that was something that's, you know, is in my mind. And I take, therefore, I take freedom, democracy, and, uh, and fundamental human decency that determines, you know, uh, and based on the sound science that determines the policy very, very seriously. So I don't know if you see it. You see my, uh, my t-shirt? <laughs> yes. And, right and good, that's yeah, right actually, good. and this is, this is what I did, you know, on June 6th, there was a, there was a uh, Black Lives Matter protest. So I take, took part in it. And that's the time that, you know, a lot of these uh, worries about pandemic, but I thought it was much more important, you know, pandemic is less important than this. This, without this pandemic or not, we're dead. So, so I obtained my bachelor's degree and master's degree in physics in Korea and did a compulsory military service in the, in the Korean army because uh, at that time, without doing that, I was not allowed to leave the country at all. Except, you know, for some people who have enough connections, they could, but, you know, no more person like me, I couldn't. I, and I joined a PhD program at Stony Brook University in New York, uh, Long Island, you know, right at the backyard of Ketebi's uh, laboratory in 1987. So uh, it's been 33 years. This is the 33rd year. Um, and obtained PhD in 1993. Uh, PhD thesis was on de jure experiment at Fermilab. This was one of the two largest experiments at that time and participated in all process of the experiment. So uh, prototyping, team, beam testing, construction, assembly, commissioning, data taking, data analysis, thesis writing, and publication of the thesis. This is essentially the entire process of, the, um, of an experiment. And I was one of the first generation graduate students who was able to do that. So here is my D0 days. Can you find me where I am? 
You guys can unmute and, and say it. Well, they can unmute, right, Hitevi? No. Nope. I no. can't see no. you. you. You cannot see me? Yeah, the picture the picture is not too, like, it's not zoomed in, so I can't really see the faces of the people. <laughs> yes, yes. This is called the central calorimeter of the D0 detector. And I built these parts, you know, I contributed in building these parts at Brookhaven National Laboratory when I was a graduate student. And then, you know, um, this is at Fermilab and I put it together, contributed to putting it together. Here is, you know, here is I am. <laughs> so there you go, it's 1990. All right, so um, all my three children were born during this period when I was a graduate student. So it was very hard for me to maintain our lives, but you know, we were able to maintain it. I thought it was very good because my, my kids learned the difficulty in their lives early on. <clears throat> early on. <clears throat> and, uh, and you know, they're, they're very, very, you know, um, they save a lot. <laughs> and so that was a good thing. And my first, doc, first postdoc, it was at the zero with University of, University of Rochester in New York. <laughs> It's uh, between 93 to 96, followed by the second postdoc at Fermilab, 96 to 98. And, you know, I worked on neutrino experiments and, uh, and that was a totally different kind of experiments than, than I was, I did my thesis. And I did, uh, I constructed the calibration beam line, run the calibration program and published the results of the calibration program. So that's another process. That's the best time that I learned about the beam. And this actually provides me a great opportunity to learn about how we manipulate these particles, charged charge particles in the accelerator. Polite experiments don't normally do that. It's followed by Fermilab staff scientists, 98 to 2001. And at that time, I returned to the D0 experiment where I did my thesis, but then I led the uh, D0 upgrade commissioning as the first commissioning coordinator when we didn't have anything. There was a uh, there was an interesting challenge, but I went through a, quite a bit of thing. At that time, we had a lot of Europeans joining in because of the delay of LHC experiments. <clears throat> and, uh, and, you know, I had to manage all those um, 650, you know, very independent cats. So then it's followed by, you know, being a professor at the University of Texas at Arlington since 2001 to present. So this is about 20 years I've been there. And I did a lot of things in, in high energy physics. I didn't, I'm not talking, I'm talking about anything in teaching, but I'm gonna talk about the uh, research. I led the design and the implementation of the first D0 computing grid. And this is why, how I got into this, uh, this business of computing. And then I led the group on the discovery of the Higgs and the, uh, in WW final states at UT Arlington. And we also made a direct contributions to the uh, search for LSC at, at, at uh, search for Higgs at the LSC experiment. I led the international, actually this was in, on D0. Um, and then I went, to, um, I went to LSC later on. And then I led international in linear collider detector, R&D and beam testing. So, you know, that's, uh, that required quite a bit of uh, wide spanning coordination with a lot of different cats in different locations. And then I joined Atlas Experiment in, uh, in, at the LHC in 2005 and led the grid computing user services uh, um, uh, system there. Uh, and then I led the subgroup in the uh, LHC Higgs cross-section working group. This is the joint theorist and experimental, experimental working group, which is still working um, you know, at this point. I contributed to the 2012 Higgs discovery. Um, so, and because of that, I had a, you know, in my life, in the first time in my life, I had live TV interview. So here is a, here is a video from live TV interview. Can you hear? Good morning. Yes, sure, sure. Article is firing up the Twitterverse. The Higgs boson is thought to be one of the missing links to knowing how life in the universe began and how all matter gets its size and shape. And one of the scientists who helped on this big project is UT Arlington professor, Dr. J. Yu. Dr. Yu, a lot of people talking about this, protons, atoms, oftentimes way over our heads, way out of our league. So why should the everyday person think that this is a really cool deal? Um, it is important because this is part of the missing puzzle in the big theory that's called the standard model that explains the fundamental. There, I think that's enough. <laughs> oh. oh no, stop, stop, there you go. Yeah, 
And then, uh, you know, I moved to neutrino experiments in 2013. And, and you know, at that, that time, I was doing both LFC, Atlas, and neutrino experiments. I created and leading a Beyond the Standard Model of Physics group. This was something that has never existed in neutrino area because in neutrino experiments, making neutrinos in themselves and, and looking, you know, finding themselves is a, is a very hard thing to do. Now we can actually think about something beyond it. I can tell you some, a little bit more about that later on. I constructed a prototype dune field cage. This is the one that provides the uniform electric field uh, to the uh, liquid argon volume that used as a sensitive matter material. And uh, for the prototype at CERN, so I'll show you a picture. And then I'm supposed to be constructing half the field cage for the first two 17 kiloton modules out of the four. So here is the picture. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, field cage. What you see around here is the field cage and it's six meter to by six meter, by six meter in this dimension as well. The one in here, in the middle, who, do you know who that is? That's me. And, uh, that's and that was- you. Yeah, That's me, you can't really tell it's me, but you know, it is me, I've been there. Um, and this was, uh, this picture was made as a, a Fermilab, um, you know, official poster. And uh, Fermilab's 55 year history, there aren't too many of people in their poster. So uh, I'm proud of this. But in any case, so, <clears throat> so how am I related to ASP? That's uh, something that you guys are most interested in. I organized the first um, in a high performance computing program in ASP 2012, so the second ASP that held in Kumasi, Ghana. And we actually came in, you know, after afterthoughts that, uh, so, um, you know, it required uh, a, a little bit of uh, logistics, you know, jumping. But, um, you know, we, I secured the funds from, U, you know, US National um, Science Foundation. Actually, that's a very good starting point that we have been getting funds from them, uh, although every time I have to apply for it. And I served as one of the internet, I'm, you know, I've been serving as one of the international organizing committee, international advisory committee, right? Katevi, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm screwed this thing up. I don't know, and, uh, this, this one. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, I continually securing funds for lecturer and, uh, and student support with uh, US NSF. And I also was able to arrange additional funding from South Korea. I think it was 2014 school, right? In Senegal. Um, yes, that's correct. That, when my friend was, uh, was a director of, uh, of a big lab there, he was fired, not because of this, but some, for something else. But I worked hard to op open PhD opportunities for ASP graduate students, you know, not as much as Katebi has been able to do, but you know, I, I try to do my part of it as much as I can. And so two students you know, graduated from a uh, University of Texas Arlington PhD uh, program. Lars Faramenga, who's a ASP 2010 grad, uh, he obtained PhD in 2016 on Atlas. He did actually a search for um, you know, the beyond the standard model Higgs particle. And this is, the, this is, uh, um, this is last. And, uh, and, you know, he just um, dropped by, he just um, moved to, uh, you know, um, a new position at the Wells Fargo um, uh, Bank at, uh, at nearby in Dallas Fort, Dallas Fort Worth area. After his PhD, he got a job from, uh, you know, for, for some kind of uh, data specialist over at some um, uh, company in uh, Tennessee. And then, and then because of his wife actually got a new job in the DFW area, so he moved here uh, recently. And here is the picture, photo of um, uh, uh, last, his wife um, uh, and, uh, and his newborn son um, visiting me in March, 2020, when they were you know, sort of staking out uh, the, um, the new place to live. And this is, this is our construction area, you can see in the back. I was showing them around what it is like. <clears throat> and then uh, the second student was, uh, uh, you know, Bright is um, he's, um, he was, he's a uh, ASP 2012 grad, and he obtained master's degree in 2015. He joined slightly later than last, but he was able to, uh, because he did master's degree in 2015. So here is, uh, 
here is Bright. And he's also in the uh, DFW area. He's a manager at uh, Blickma. Um, I don't know what that does, but, uh, and, you know, since April 2016. So he's been there for four years now. I hope so, that... Uh, so Lass, that uh, just uh, Lass is from uh, Zambia and Bright is from Nigeria. Yeah. No, no, Lass is from Zimbabwe. Ah, uh, Zimbabwe. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> Bright is from Nigeria. Um, one of the important things that I want to tell you, I'm, I want to open this kind of opportunity as much as I can so that you guys can come in and join my research um, you know, a project here. We have a lot of opportunities. Um, one of the important things that I want to tell you uh, based on these experience is that, uh, that you really have to get all this English and, uh, and GRE related stuff out of the way when you join it because it's very difficult to, uh, to keep up with uh, what's happening uh, without having that kind of thing out of the way. Okay, so I hope that you guys keep that in your mind. And, uh, and you know, I, I want to make sure that you guys contact me if you want to come and work here. Um, you have my email address on the uh, Indico page. Um, and uh, we have a lot of activities and, and our neutrino program has grown significantly at our university as well. We have three faculty members. So you guys, are, you guys have a lot of opportunities to work with us. Okay, you guys have any questions before I go into my lecture part? Of this? <clears throat> okay, uh, may you talk to us uh, a little bit about your uh, current research in high energy physics? That's what I'm gonna do after this. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, you can always ask me a question afterwards, okay? So I'm gonna go in. So here, this is my opening slide and I've been using this for a while. So if you have been to any other school, then you might have, you might have seen this before. But if you go to the backyard when you know, it's, there are not too many background lights, then you will always, you see these beautiful skies. And you will always wonder, you know, what makes up this beautiful universe? And how does it actually work? And it works in such a way that it's just rotates in, in a very regular fashion. And then of course, you know, then, then the fundamental question that we always ask is that, you know, what, what am I, what, you know, where do I all come from in this universe? And that's the question that we always ask, whether you're a scientist like myself, or you're, um, you know, a religious person and like uh, a priest somewhere, you know, it's always the same question. We're trying to find the answer. We're actually approaching that answer coming from the scientific realm versus the religious and spiritual realm. And, uh, and so to me, you know, we're, we, us, us trying to fight each other and said, I'm right and you're wrong is just not the right approach. So high energy physics, if I were to, um, you know, define it in an elevator talk, I would say it's a, it's a subfield of, you know, for instance, you know what an elevator talk is, guys? <clears throat> elevator talk is, uh, is suppose you, you know, I walk into an elevator and uh, I, I'm gonna go up two story and, uh, and I, I face, um, you know, Mr. Our dear leader Trump. And I have to explain what I do to him in two flight of the elevator. And that's what, uh, what that is, right? So you should be able to make enough impression and give everything that you can tell about what you do to a person, important person. So um, my definition of high energy particle physics is a subfield of physics that pursues understanding the fundamental constituent of matter, in other words, of what the universe is made of and basic principles of interactions between them. In other words, the forces between them. As you know, there are you know, four forces, four known fundamental interactions, right? The gravitational force, electromagnetic force, weak nuclear force and strong nuclear force. Those are the four known ones at this point. We don't see anything else, but we never know if that's the only one, okay? And of those, these two, electromagnetic and uh, weak nuclear force, actually electromagnetic force itself was also understood to be two different forces uh, until, you know, 19th century. And then we figured out that they are coming from the same principle, which is the principle for generating electricity. <clears throat> You probably learned about this in the uh, in electromagnetism, and then you know weak nuclear force are united as one in early 1980s at CERN. 
Uh, current theory is called the standard model of particle physics, and this is some kind of special unitarity groups, but it's okay, it's a mathematical thing. That's, you know, the group definition is what provides us certain ideas behind it. So, um, you know, the standard model, we, you know, we have this kind of particle map. I mean, you know, this is just simple, very simple and elegant, right? And it says total of 16 fundamental particles, four, four, four in three different families. And, and they make up all the visible matter in the universe. And of course, there are some bosons that makes up, um, you know, that uh, mediates the forces and something that actually results of a, you know, manifestation of uh, getting a mass and stuff, okay? So 12 plus four different types of force mediators that make up the entire universe. Isn't that just amazing? Total of 16 particles. And, you know, I wouldn't believe it if they, if theorists comes and tell me, but if you look at it and, you know, there was, you, you remember that uh, you make a mental image of that and you see this chemical periodic table of elements. There are a huge number of them at the moment. There are 130 some elements of them and we're still making more. <clears throat> so if you think about this, then, you know, compared to this, the previous table is a very, very simple and elegant, as you can see, that much simpler. And it's what's more important is that, the, you know, of these, these guys make up most of the ordinary matters. That's so all the things that you saw in the previous periodic table are made of these three guys. Okay, up quark, down quark, which the different combination of those makes protons and neutrons, which forms a nucleus. And then the electron actually circles around the nucleus that make up an atom and three make up entire 134. Isn't that absolutely gorgeous? I, I, I think about it, that it's just amazing. These guys matter, you know, these quirks, um, you know, uh, masses are, you know, less than 10% of the proton mass, okay? <clears throat> and then this guy here, the top quirk, was discovered in 1995, and we found that that's, the, that's about 175 times the proton mass, and it's a fundamental particle. Proton is not a fundamental particle because it's a made of quark, up quark and down quark, okay? So you can always already see something strange here, okay? And of course, Higgs particle is something that was discovered in 2012. It's a manifestation of the mechanism that gives the you know, masses to these fundamental particles. And these days, we're actually talking about these neutrinos. Neutrinos are, you know, chargeless, electro, electricity, you know, they don't have electricity. And chargeless, you know, pair are the um, uh, mass, massive leptons. And these guys are charged, muons and tau and leptons. These guys are called light particles, light in the, in the mass-wise. And... <clears throat> and they're neutral uh, cousins of those. And these guys behave very strange. And that's, the, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually looking into the neutrino interactions at this point. So what are the, some issues in high energy particle physics? I mean, you know, I end the previous map, I told you, I, I forgot to tell you that this has to be, has been tested to, pre to a precision of one part per million. <clears throat> And the precision is increasing, improving every, you know, uh, ever more. And so therefore, if that's all verified, what's the problem? Well, the, uh, the problem is that, you know, why is the mass range of these fundamental particles so large? 10% of the proton mass to 175 times the proton mass. That's a little smelly, isn't it? It just doesn't seem to make sense. We call that hierarchy, mass hierarchy problem. And of course, it's the particle that's discovered in the LHC in 2012, really the Higgs particle that standard model says it is. So far, it looks just like that. And you will hear about that uh, more in more detail um, on Thursday, right, Ketavi? Mario is yes. talking about it on Thursday? That's yeah. right, yeah. So about that on Thursday. And then, of course, why is matter in the universe made only of particles, okay? When we collide particles in the accelerator, we see uh, the particles and antiparticles produced in a similar, you know, about the same number. So why is it that uh, universe is only made of particles? If you think about this, this is a, <clears throat> this is a good thing because, um, because, you know, suppose you're walking down the street and there is anti-you coming from the other side 
and Auntie Yu was so happy to see you, you know, that uh, she comes and hugs you, then what happens to you? You turn into a blob of energy, and then you, I don't know, comes out to, um, you know, um, three kids or something, okay? So that's a, that's, that's a good thing, that uh, there's only particles. But, you know, we know that they are anti-particles that exist about the same number. Why is there asymmetry? That's an important question. And of course, neutrinos, which, which you know, in the particle <coughs> map that you saw in the previous page, neutrinos are supposedly massless, okay? Because there are phenomena that can only be explained if neutrinos have mass, uh, neutrinos do not have mass. But, you know, we did through the, um, you know, some 20, 30 years of, um, of uh, measurement, we did find that neutrinos show indication of mass, having mass. Because you know when they have mass and flavor, you know differences, then uh, then as they fly, they change their flavor as they go along. It's a quantum mechanical you know uh, phenomena that you might have seen. It's called oscillation, and that's a big problem because that means standard model, which you know requires neutrinos to be massless, are broken. So we have to do the study. So this is. <clears throat> this is the thing that we are actually trying to do using, uh, you know, building a new uh, facility and the detector at Fermi Lab at this point. And I'm involved in that experiment at this point. And why are there only four apparent forces, as I told you? And of course, the big question is that at the beginning of the universe, at the Big Bang, are these all forces unified? And, you know, if you think about it, it seems to make sense because at the very beginning of the universe, let's say entire universe, the energy or mass, the same thing, right? <clears throat> We're all, all combined into one little tiny, you know, point that you can't see. The energy density is so high, so you can imagine all these forces may appear to be one. And as, uh, as the universe expands, cool down, they may appear to be four different forces. But you know, if they're unified at the Big Bang, and we think that's correct. You know, this is not this Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you guys watch this Big Bang Theory. Do you know this, uh, this sitcom Big Bang Theory? Yes. Yeah, do you guys like it? Well, you can raise your yes. hand if you want. Yeah, yeah. So who do you think I am out of this? <clears throat> It's an interactive session, so you can you can uh, mute the yourself. The one with glasses. The one with glasses. Yes. Yeah. Why? Uh, I don't know. Why, <laughs> well, uh, Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> Sheldon Cooper. Okay, Sheldon Cooper is smart, but all these guys are smart. Sheldon is a little too, uh, you know, egocentric. <clears throat> I'm an experimentalist, so therefore that's me. And of course, you know, I always, you know, have um, um, always a good um, personality. Okay, so, okay, so what, you know, if you think about this, if all these four apparent forces are unified into one, what do you think you can do? So here is my first, um, uh, um, first 1,000 year dreams. How does a nuclear power plant work? Um, you know, some of you guys may know because you guys are, you know, nuclear uh, engineer. <clears throat> but this is how it works. Very simplified picture. I, I just uh, borrowed it from Duke, Duke Energy. If you look at it, <clears throat> there are three different portions. One, energy generating. And two, energy capturing. And three, electricity generating. Okay, so if you think about it, then energy generating process is, is a quantum mechanical process where you take the nucleus and you break the nucleus apart. And as you break it apart, energy gets released. Now, energy capturing process, however, is, is the 19th century. You know, what it does is it takes the energy and that energy boils the water and it generates steam, right? So steam generator, so it's a steam engine. Okay, it generates a steam, and that steam then goes to and turns to turbine. And turbine is connected to a generator, which has a magnet on it, uh, inside of the coil, and that pushes the electricity out. So if you look at this, you know, what would you say? I mean, you look at it and say, oh my gosh, this picture is just wrong. And this picture is wrong because, you know, we have, 
we have quantum mechanical advanced knowledge that can only be captured using through the 19th century technology, steam engine technology. And this is one of the reasons why it's so dangerous to, uh, to use this nuclear power plant, okay? But if all the forces are united into one, in other words, the nuclear force, weak force that actually generates this nuclear energy, can be just directly, um, you know, turn into electricity. I don't know how you do that, but <clears throat> that's what engineers are supposed to do. So I think it could take quite a while. First, we have to prove that uh, they are all united into one at the big, very beginning of the universe. And then, you know, we have to make um, the condition that can generate this, um, that can go from nuclear force directly to electricity. But the important thing is that if we know that this principle is correct, then, then we, can, we can dream about taking that nuclear energy and turn it right into the power of <clears throat> electricity. If I can do that, <clears throat> then I can imagine having a very small, very safe nuclear reactor that generates electricity almost permanently so that you can actually put it in your car and you drive the car forever without charging it, without ever charging it or ever releasing any toxic gas, okay? Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, I can even imagine you know, taking that, uh, you know, building a house uh, on top of Himalaya so that I can have uh, electricity and, and everything. So we can make electricity from, from you know, d directly from nuclear forces, okay? And so you're saying, oh, that guy is crazy. You know, you're talking about something that may never happen. Well, it may never happen in our lifetime, but it may happen a thousand years down the road. And I checked this idea with, uh, with Nobel laureate. Um, you know, Steven Weinberg, I don't know if you know him. He's, um, he's uh, one of the inventors of the standard model. And uh, I invited him once at our university. And, uh, and hang on a second, I gotta, I gotta take this call for a second. Sorry about this. Uh, All right, sorry about that. <clears throat> right, so when I invited him for a public lecture, which we had about 2,000 people in it, and uh, I've never seen um, you know, a physics public lecture generating 2,000 audience. But in any case, um, you know, I, and when I took him home, um, you know, I told him about this, and you know, it was obvious that he never thought about it this way. But he says that, oh, wow, that's possible, of course, uh, but, uh, but it's gonna take a while. Okay, so I'm not really talking about something that may never happen. It could happen if we prove that's correct. And of course, the, the next question is, is the picture that we present for the universe real thing? We think that the universe is, you know, this pie chart. We, you know, we're dealing with only four to five percent of the normal matter, including galaxy and dark, you know, <clears throat> black holes and everything. It's the normal matter. That's only four percent, four to five percent. 25% is uh, made of dark matter, which we can't see. That's why it's called dark matter. But we know that they exist because if you look at the galaxy spinning, um, with the speed that the galaxy spins, none of these stars can stay in their place. Therefore, there should be a centripetal force from the gravitational mass that gives the force to keep them in place. And of course, we learned in, uh, in 1980s that uh, there are, you know, the energy lurking around the entire universe, and we call that dark energy. Okay, so <clears throat> if, uh, if that's real thing, if, you know, what makes up the remaining 95% of the universe is an important thing. Okay, and are there any other particles we don't know of? It's a big deal for new LSC run and the, you know, upcoming the um, uh, high luminosity LSC runs and new kinds of experiments that's coming up in the US. My second 1000 year dream is here in, uh, in generating uh, dark matter beam, <clears throat> making dark matter beam and so that we can use dark matter. I hope that that can be less than 10, 1000 years, but we'll see. <clears throat> and, and, and of course, you know, the question, the pre pre ever, ever fundamental question of where do we all come from? But to me, the most important thing as a scientist and engineers and no matter what you do is how can we live well in the universe 
as an integral partner without destroying the nature. And that's, uh, that's what we're trying to figure it out, all to live together. Okay, so for this, we use uh, accelerator. An accelerator works as if it's a powerful you know, tele uh, microscope, okay? They have high energy particles, particle beams coming in. And you know, suppose you, were, you wanna look at what's inside of this mouse. You know, can you see the mouse? What you do, you can throw this mouse onto the floor and it will break apart, right? Then you can see inside. Of course, many of you guys will use, you know, screwdrivers, but, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm not that smart. So I do that. Uh, and, uh, and, huh? Can I explain this picture? Oh, somebody said, can you explain pick this picture one more time? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that chat. Which, which picture are you talking about, um, Aditya, Aditya? I can talk about it afterwards, okay? It's good? All right, so, um, so if the, um, and if you wanna look at uh, more detail, then what you do, you take a hammer and hit it, right? Then we'll break it smaller. <clears throat> and of course, if you wanna look at it even smaller, then you take even bigger hammer and hit it. What does that mean? That means every time you're you know, changing this bigger hammer and hitting it harder means that you're increasing the kinetic energy of the incoming probe, which is this beam works as if that, you know, it works just like that, okay? So if you were to shoot something with low energy beam, then it may appear to be as one. But if you were to shoot it as a, as a high energy beam, then it may appear to be, you can actually see a you know, small structure <clears throat> like this. Okay, and you know it's a quantum mechanical thing, but you know fundamental idea is the same as uh, as increasing the kinetic energy. How does a nuclear energy work? Ah, okay. Well, we'll we'll talk about that afterwards. Okay, Aditya, because we have to go back. <clears throat> An accelerator also, um, you know, works as if it's time machine because we generate the particles that was not. Seen, you know, that has been seen at the very beginning of the universe, but not seen now, okay? So if you were to have particle and antiparticle beam colliding, which is the LHC, uh, which not the LHC, but you know, in the, uh, um, in, in, in the particles and antiparticles or particles, particle beam, then those turn into a blob of energy and that energy then comes out to be a new particle. And that's, you know, based on this famous, you know, um, famous formula, E equals MC squared. You guys know this formula, right? Hello? Unmute yourselves and say, yeah. Yes, we know. What, what, is, what does this mean, guys? You can type it in if you want into your- Energy equals to mass times uh, speed of light squared. Right, so that's, a, that's the mathematical formula. You just read off that formula. But what does it actually mean in terms of physics? <clears throat> that mass is nothing but a form of energy. That's very good. That's, uh, that's going from left to right, yeah? <clears throat> and the other way, it could mean also the other way as well. Since it's an equal sign, <clears throat> That means if you have energy, then you can generate mass. That has to work as well. And we've actually seen that from, uh, from particle accelerators because this energy then turns into different kinds of particles as long as the energy conservation is kept. Okay, so now we have two large accelerators. Uh, we had one was actually called Femilab Tevatron and another one, uh, let's see. Okay, now I'm having trouble with my, my computer. Okay, so Tevatron was, was world highest energy proton antiproton collider and still is, it's just not running anymore. It's four, a, four kilometer circumference and it's energy, I don't know what's going on with my computer. Its energy is uh, two tera electron volt and you know, it doesn't give you a real good feel what two tera electron volt means. And you know, its total energy is uh, 13 megajoules. And that still doesn't tell you, right? And this 13 megajoules is on the area smaller than 10 to the minus four um, uh, square meters. In other words, you know, uh, less than one square centimeter, okay? 
And this is equivalent to the kinetic energy of a 20 ton truck running at the speed of 130 kilometers an hour. You can't imagine how it feels like when you're driving, you know, like me in a small, you know, dinky Honda and you're, you're, you know, running by this big truck and you feel that energy, right? And of course, the energy density of that particular thing is 100,000 times the energy density at the ground zero, which is the explosion point of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So you can imagine how much of energy density we are talking about, okay? And you don't want to cross that beam because that's going to be a disastrous thing. This Tevatron was shut down in 2011, right? You know, the year after the LHC was turned on. And now they have new frontier with high intensity proton beams. So here was a Tevatron, so here's Chicago. Fermilab is about 40 miles uh, or 60 kilometers west of Chicago. And this was the Tevatron. And now they're using this main injector to shoot the beam at high intensity proton beams down that direction and down this direction from the neutrino experiment and search for dark matter with the beam. And we're leading the dark matter um, effort at, uh, at uh, Fermilab on this, using the beam, yeah? And these are, this one was the one that I was involved in it. Uh, LSC, Large Hadron Collider, is world highest energy proton-proton collider, 27 kilometer circumference, 100 meter underground, as you know. And the energy is 14 tera electron volt or 362 megajoules of total energy. This is equivalent to the kinetic energy of the Boeing 727 plane. 80 ton plane at the speed of 310 kilometers an hour. And this is enough kinetic energy for, for the plane to take off. And somebody asked me, if any particle attains speed of light, will the mass decrease? No, that's not, that actually works the other way around. Um, you know, you can have speed of light um, only if your mass is zero, okay? And, uh, and if you have mass, then as the, as the speed goes up, your, your apparent mass goes up, and therefore uh, you cannot pass the speed of light, and that's the part of the spatial relativity principle, okay? All right, <clears throat> and, um, and it's uh, three million times the energy density. It discovered a new heavy particle that looks like Higgs in 2012, and you know, search for a new particle has been ongoing there, and they have been shut down for upgrade for the high luminosity large hadron collider that increases the the brightness of the beam by over a factor of ten. Uh, but you know this is now done and it's about to resume. So in about six seven months time scale, they'll start the accelerator back up. And here is my experiment uh, atlas. Um, and uh, and and Katebi is also an atlas. Here is our competitor experiment CMS, and there are other experiments as well. And so this is an aerial view of the uh, Large Hadron Collider. This is the circumference and how the accelerator looks like, but 100 meter underground. So this is just, uh, just to show you how it looks like. Here is the Atlas experiment. Here is Switzerland, here is France, and they're right at the border of France and Switzerland. And inside of the lab, you go you cross the border. Okay, and here is the Atlas experiment. I don't know if you guys know this movie, Angels and Demons. Do you guys know this? No. Okay. You, if you can, you know, uh, I think you can go to Netflix or something, or and you know, watch this movie. It's a, it's a fun movie. I, I read the book twice, and uh, and you know, watched the movie twice because um, when I went to visited Korea at that time to give a lecture, um, I was told requested by the, you know, the the, the hosts to uh, to talk about this. So I had to learn about this. All right. So. Then, you know, well, accelerator is one thing, but we have to see, we have to use, detect the interactions of these uh, different particles. And that's what the detectors are doing. They work as if they are camera. Okay? They capture the image of the interaction that happens. Here is Atlas. You can see there is, uh, there is people here, a lot bigger than CMS. And CMS is compact and very dense. And that's, uh, that's the difference between them. They weigh each weigh about 7,000 tons and they're 10 story tall, okay? They record two, they were recording 200 to 400 collisions per second. I think this is about to be the same. It's just that they have a smarter system that can filter out much better, much, much better um, 
uh, events that are more interesting, uh, and out of 50 million interactions. And it records approximately about, um, you know, um, half a gigabyte a second. And therefore, they record the pure data two petabyte per year. And that two petabyte is 200 times of all the printed material in the US Library of Congress. If you had any chance to come and study in the US, I suggest you to visit Washington DC and drop by this, you know, library. I have actually a, a report that I wrote that's, that's actually kept in that library. <clears throat> okay, so um, the next big thing, this is the, um, you know, LSC experiments that you guys know very well. Next big thing is called DUNE, and DUNE stands for Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Actually, underground has to be one word, and this is how the logo looks like. It's a one and a half billion dollar US flagship long baseline experiment, neutrino experiment. Baseline being the distance between the beam and the uh, detection point is 1300 kilometers. And you know, US is a big place because you can actually have 1300 kilometers inside of itself, and it's actually you know not even one third of it. Okay, and it's a fi it's located 1500 meter underground in the abandoned mine, South Dakota. And you you know here is frame left site where you take the beam and shoot it off to um to the ground. Do you guys know why we're shooting it into the ground? Not sure about that. Not really. Well, shooting into the ground because it's 1,300 kilometers away, so therefore you actually have to go think about the uh, you know, curvature of the Earth, right? You can't do the surface. You have to go in the, in the Earth because the neutrino beam go through the Earth and hit the detector 1,300 kilometers away. And in the 13, underground 1,300 kilometers, this is a new cabin that we are building right now. And there are four cabins that can hold 80,000 tons of liquid argon in four different uh, vessels. And these are called cryostats. Each of these four guys look like this. So it's actually one giant cryostat that can keep the um, uh, that can keep uh, the low temperature liquid argon in there. Liquid argon is uh, just two degrees higher temperature than the liquid nitrogen. And this dimension is 66 meters by 15 meters tall by 15 meters wide. So you can imagine how big this thing is. And you saw the prototype in the picture that I showed you, right? That's only one fortieth of this. So you can imagine how big this thing is. And there are four of these guys, okay? So there is a whole lot of this uh, construction and physics that we can do with these detectors. <clears throat> one of the things, um, you know, um, the group that I'm leading is doing is to look for the cosmogenic dark matter that's coming inside here. And we have a very interesting final state that we can look for it, okay? <clears throat> okay, and this is a this is an event from the prototype detector, and you can see that the muons coming in, going through, and this is beautiful. It provides a beautiful picture of the interactions of these um, these particles. Okay, in the liquid argon time projection chamber, <clears throat> and this is muon with a lot of uh, you know small particles that are radiated as it comes out. And there are, this is another event that has two, um, you know, hadronic interactions. They come in and break apart the nucleus and you can see the secondary particles coming out. Aren't they a beautiful picture? But because of these guys are, <clears throat> you have to record every single point of these from every single particles that are happening and interacting inside of the detector and not just synchronized with the beam that's coming in, but also synchronized um, being able to capture the events that comes in any time they like, okay? So that's why it means that it requires a whole lot of the, you know, um, storage space in computing power. <clears throat> so the way that it works is that you have proton, antiproton, or proton, proton, or, you know, neutrino comes in and interact inside a detector. And of all, every single dot of those things have to be digitized into a digital record of the event. So you, when you take the um, you know, digital camera photo, it uh, records into a file. That's exactly what we do here, okay? And we then record it into um, tape because apparently tape is the most reliable medium. 
And these things are actually a big house. You know, you have huge number of apes in there and there is a robotic arm that's going around and processing all those data. In other words, take tape and put it into a tape um, recorder so that you can you know, look at the data and stuff. And then you take that data out and reconstruct and do the analysis in these farms of small computers, okay? So if you look at this and say, oh my gosh, huge amount of data recorded in it. We have to process them really fast. And of course, we have to allow people, to contribute, the people who are taking part in the analysis to be able to get at the data really fast. Because you know, if you take the data and put it in and record it and do nothing, then that's useless. Okay, so detectors are very complicated and large. I told you how large it is, right? And you know, that means you need large number of collaborators from all over the world, okay? And so, you know, LSC collaborators, here is uh, Atlas and CMS. Uh, this is, you know, this probably have been moving around a little bit, but not as much. And Atlas and CMS total six to 7,000 physicists and engineers over 60 countries, 250 institutions, huge number of institutions. And of course, upcoming neutrino experiments, okay? Dune collaboration here is, this is how the map of Dune collaboration looks like. It's, you know, all this orange part is, um, is the place, uh, the country that has contributing collaborators in it, okay? I hope to see this, you know, African countries also take part in it. Okay, and so there are over a thousand collaborators, 184 institutions from 31 countries, and it's increasing ever more. Okay, so that's uh, no, we, we that's have how, Madagascar, right? At least Madagascar is in there. Oh, yeah, Madagascar. I think Mar Morocco is in there too. I think this map may be a little bit off. Okay, yeah, who's this here, right there? Isn't that Madagascar? That's Madagascar, and uh, it's actually the PI. There is a former yeah. ASP student. Oh, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Fantastic. He, yeah. Yeah. And Morocco is over here, right? Uh, the, to the, to, the, to here? the west part, the western part yeah. of Africa, yeah. by, just below Spain. Yeah. Right here. No, 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 no. no. The other side. The other side. This side. That's right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right here. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, you can see that, uh, that you know, my geography is all not that good. <laughs> I've been there, I've been to Morocco a few times, uh, a couple of times, but I, you know, forget. But in any case, so this is, uh, this is one of the pictures. Uh, you know where I am? Right there. It's really hard to find, so I'm, I always mark. I show these pictures to my students in my class. They are scattered all over the world, as you can imagine, then communicating quickly and discussing about the physics um, you know, outcome of the analyzed data is becoming very, very difficult, okay? So how do we leverage collaborators' capabilities that are all over the world and allowing them to be able to get at it? And how do we utilize all computing resources? And, you know, have us having to be able to talk to each other like this through Zoom, it already is something that, uh, that I take pride in high energy particle physics computing has been making, you know, good contribution to the world. Okay. And how do we utilize all the computing resources that everybody has in the world? And of course, data size is large, over 10 petabytes. And probably it's, you know, if you're talking about reconstructed data and reprocessed data, we're talking about exabyte of data soon. Okay. And the entire data set, um, you know, is 15 plus petabytes on, on the discovery, 2012 discovery only. So where and how to store the large amount of data? And how do we allow collaborators scattered all over the world to access the data in an efficient fashion? These are fundamental questions that we have to answer. This was actually the data that was used under discovery for you know, 2010 to 2012. You can see how much of different kind of data is piling up. And you already see that that was, you know, the amount of data that we used is much less than 20 times 20, um, uh, less than factor 20 of the entire data that we have at the moment in the LSC. And that was already, you know, over 15 petabytes. Yeah? So that's a huge amount of data. <clears throat> okay, so how do we then, then how do we allow people's analysis jobs to access data and make progress rapidly and securely? You know that how, you know, these days, these, uh, you know, IDs, um, theft is a very important thing, very, very 
crucial, right? And also, you know, the, the security, computing security could impact, you know, even the um, uh, election of a country, <clears throat> okay? And that's, that could be a devastating effect, okay? So what's the most efficient way to get the jobs required matched with resources? How should the jobs go to data, job to data goes to jobs? It depends on how it goes. And I think this, this is somewhat resolved, but we're still working on, you know, what would be the best way of doing it. And what level of security should there be? <clears throat> how do we allow experiments to reconstruct, reconstruct data and generate the large amount of simulated events? When you are looking for a rare events, you really have to know what you're doing in order for us to do that. We have to have predictions and predictions should be, you know, giving us some idea as to how it looks like in the detector, okay? That means we need huge amount of simulated data. So how do we garner the necessary computing and storage resources effectively and efficiently? And what network cap capabilities do we need in the world to make this happen? Now you know that, uh, that they're actually using robotic arms to allow um, you know, doctors to perform remote surgery. And, uh, and you, know, you, can't, you can't rely on unstable network that could go down at the time of during the surgery, right? And how do we get people to analyze, you know, at their desktop or maybe in their, in their computer? I mean, you know, the, um, uh, the telephone. So computing grid idea was very old thing, okay? And well, okay, old being about 20, 20 some years old. And it's a geographically distributed computing resources configured for coordinated use. So you can see that this is a very good um, uh, elevator talk. Uh, physical resources and good network provides hardware capabilities and the middleware software link them together and harness them so that they can work together even if they are scattered all over the world. This is just the US, but that was the idea and that's the book that actually described that idea by Ian Foster. And, uh, and I think that's Chris Kesselman. So how does the computing grid work? I mean, you know, this is how it works. Your, your, you know, here is your desktop. And then you have uh, you know sub site and sites are all over the place and they're connected and the execution site have the um, have your job so you can send your job over your job is going to be executing doing the data analysis and then you know and record the output into the data distribution system. So the idea was like this a tree system like this the initial idea behind the physics computing model and this was uh, this was what I implemented in Vjira as I told you. And you know the idea is that this is murky and it's in the in the cloud somewhere that nobody need to know. The only thing you need to know is that you can send the job somewhere and it will it will be processed precisely and accurately and quickly and returned to you uh, in the proper fashion. And this is what's implemented in Atlas Computing Grid, where tier zero is the CERN and that has a 15% processing. And then of course it sends out to tier one central uh, sites, centers, you know, in you know, one per each country or so, that's how it looks like. And it goes to tier two centers. And there are different fraction of the jobs that are processed and the data stored. And this is, this is how it looks like. I mean, again, as you can see that this is drawn in the circle, but it's still having the same kind of tree structure, hierarchical structure where you have tier zero that has the center that collects the raw data and then spread the things out. <clears throat> UTA is one of those um, uh, tier two sites. And here is the BNL uh, where Katebi is. Katebi is the boss. So the BNL tier one site, um, you know, as a US tier one site is the BNL. And then we have, you know, I only have five here. I think there is one more that since then we had this picture. And UTA is one of those uh, tier, tier two sites here. <clears throat> okay. And of course, you know, the software that was developed to, um, to harness and utilize these, uh, these hardware, we call that uh, PANDA, uh, Production and Distribution Distributed Analysis System. And uh, I, I take pride in coining the name PANDA because uh, you know, they were discussing which name, PANDA or MAGPIE, and I said PANDA sounds better. All right, in any case, um, so um, it designed for analysis as well as production. It works for all this different kind of backbone framework, a uh, software framework that allows the data access in different, um, different um, uh, platforms. 
Um, and there is a single task that queues and pilots and, and you know, it's, it uses all these different kind of structure. I mean, you know, if we had uh, ASP, if you were able to have ASP, then, you know, these things would be actually um, in, integrated into the uh, classes that you would be learning and you could have a hands-on session. But let me just go through this, uh, this quickly. And it's a highly automated system with an integrated monitoring system because you have to, you have to know where you're flying to and requires low operational manpower. You don't want people to be involved in all the time and that because that's, that's not the idea of using computing. And we integrate with the Atlas system, but it also is working now uh, well for many different kinds of systems, not just Atlas, but also, you know, I think CMS uses part of this as well. And then of course, you know, other disciplines such as the uh, uh, biology and, uh, and, you know, meteorology and all these things. So, you know, so how do we use that? Uh, and why do we use this kind of system? So let me just give you some uh, example in physics wise. And this is actually involving part of the research that I'm involved in too. <clears throat> so many of these, um, you know, the rates, uh, these rare events, this has to be rare, rare events, particles are so heavy and they decay into their lighter particles instantaneously. The Higgs particle is one of such cases. When one searches for a new particle, one look for the easiest possible way to get at them when you search for them, okay? Of many signatures of the rare particles, final states, some are much easier to find. So for example, for the standard model particle Higgs, Higgs to photons, two photons is much easier to find. Higgs to two Z particles, which result in four electrons and four muons, a combination of those guys, easy to, e easiest to find, yeah? And, or the Higgs going into WW, which, you know, I've been involved in for a long time, is, you know, going into two electron final state and two muon final state and things like that. And, of course, there are many more complicated signatures, but these guys are easiest. Okay, now, how do we look for a rare events? Well, you first identify the rare event candidate events. So Higgs events, if it was Higgs, then they should look like this. So here's a Higgs decaying into two Zs, giving you two, electro, two pairs of um, electrons, positrons, or two pairs of uh, muons and anti-muons and stuff, okay? And then we understand the face, and we call that background, okay? That's gonna, that looks just like the signature, but but it actually is not really the signature. So we should be able to understand them and we should be able to you know, have some expectations of what my signature looks like. And therefore then I can look for a bump like this, for instance, in this particular kind of you know, variable, you can look for a bump like that. You see the bump? Everybody, do you guys see the bump? Yes. Yeah, where is it? Yes. Wherever, it doesn't matter. Okay, the important point is that they look for the bump, okay? So that's where the bump is, as you know. So you can see that the each data point have huge uncertainties there, okay? And that's when you don't have enough statistics, you will have that. And I want you guys to, to notice that in the next picture, okay? So, so large, large amount of data is absolutely critical. You gotta have a lot of data. So, the amount of LSC data that we've, um, we've taken so far, this is, um, you know, date per year and, you know, different years, 2011, 15, 12, and, you know, blah, de, blah, de, blah. You can see 2018, just before, up to the shutdown, the um, accelerator was performing like crazy. This was where the discovery announcement was made in 2012, July 4th, okay? And of course, there are a huge number of these uh, statistics that was, uh, that was, you know, taken from, <clears throat> from the LSC. 2018 data take peak instantaneous luminosity was what their goal, they accomplished what their goal was, which was two times center 34th. And it's a superb performance. So these are absolutely essential for us to be able to look for rare events. You know, you push the energy and you push the intensity of the beam. So, you know, both things has to come together. Well, when you have a lot of intensity, there is uh, this kind of challenges. You see that there are all huge number of interactions. So when you have proton and antiproton passing through each other, many pairs of protons and antiprotons, or protons, protons collide and giving you this kind of complicated picture. But we should be able to find an event like this, where you have two muons coming out of 
many of these interactions. And this is how it happens. And it's high luminosity LHC, it's even bigger. You will have huge, much more, many more um, interactions happening, maybe um, it's a couple of hundred at the same time. So it's 25 collisions in this one, but you know, in the uh, upcoming ones it is. So what does statistics do for Higgs to gamma gamma? So here, I want you guys to look for it. This is an animation of as the data is accumulated, you can see a particular bump showing up. Then bumping will not look just like the, uh, you know, so obvious, but I want you guys to identify what mass on the x-axis number from this particular animation. And you can see, you have to have your eyes trained and see um, a bump showing up. Are you guys ready? <clears throat> okay, here you go. You guys see the bump yet? If you see the bump, you tell me what the x-axis number is. You see a bump? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you do? Yes. yes. You can, you, yeah, where is it? That's 125. 125? Let's look at it again. So you guys pay attention. So at the beginning, when we don't have enough statistics, you don't see the bump showing up too obviously, right? But as we get more data, you can see a bump that's actually showing up here. This blue line is uh, what's expected from the background. And this red line here, oop de doo is where the bump is, 125, as you said. This is how we find. And this is why it is so important and essential to have enough um, you know, large enough statistics to get this, okay? How about this guy, this particular signature? The red is the um, background, you should see the signal. You see a signal showing up? You see a bump? This is not as obvious, right? <clears throat> you see a bump, guys? See right there? That's where the bump is, right? So you can see the point, right? The important thing is that you have to have enough statistics. This one is, uh, you know, you will see a lot more. Now, of course, what does statistics do? Sometimes it will give us fake signature like this. Do you see a bump here? Guys, do you see a bump? Yes. Where do you see it? Where do you see the bump? What's the x-axis value? 700 or something. Yeah, 700 something. You yeah. see right there, right? It, it looks like it's something, right? So there. This looks interesting, right? It's a 760. And that was, that was when we didn't have enough data, okay? But then as we accumulate more data, it's a, it was 4.6 sigma. And 4.6 sigma means that it's 0.01% probability of not it not being something. But when we had... Four times more data, do you see the bump? No, you don't see it anymore, all right? So then, that's what statistics can do. And this is the reason why you have to have something much higher than, you know, just four sigma uh, signature for the discovery, okay? So the performance of grid in the LHC, you know, we implemented the grid into the LHC and, you know, Atlas Distributed Computing has huge number of tier, tier one centers and tier two centers, high volume, high throughput process with a fast network. And this is how it looked like different kind of activities. Blue is the Monte Carlo generation and red is the analysis. As you can see that there is a huge bump here when we were doing the analysis for the discovery of the Higgs particle. And, uh, and, you know, over 830 kilo, you know, 830,000 daily average computing. And I think it's even higher now. It was at 2012. And the data available, the physics analysis was, you know, this actually shows how long it took for data to be available. It's within more than, you know, 90% of them are within five hours of the day. Okay, so that's, a, that's an amazing feat. 
And this is how the data transfer occurs. So it's not just doing the data reconstruction or data analysis. Data has to be able to transfer and get to the people to do the analysis fast. And this is how it looks like. So up to six gigabyte per week average. <clears throat> And of course, this is a software performance, you know, that's showing, you know, what the analysis looks like and the Monte Carlo generation and the management of the software itself that shows, you know, more than, you know, tens of millions of jobs completed every month at, you know, over a hundred sites and it's, and, you know, combining all these different jobs and managing it properly and get them, you know, deliver them in the optimistic fashion. Of course, then, you know, you, one of the important thing of the computing grid idea was to uh, using, you know, the um, opportunistic computing resources. In other words, it's not owned by you, but by somebody else like Amazon, and you can actually start using their resources when those resources are cheaply available, and you can actually see them, you know, sort of tipping up like that. Okay. <clears throat> and and these things actually go into, uh, you know, the, these are the ones that are available um, for Panda to use. And, and, you know, many different kind of, you know, computing resources, for instance, Amazon, you know, cloud is available for it to use. And, you know, a lot of these high energy physics computing people are, have been working with these companies to do it. Now, of course, the commercial world picked up <clears throat> in early nineties, you know, we have, um, <clears throat> we have the web, of course, Amazon, Google are coming up, and of course, these different kind of thing. And you know, as recently as now, VoIP, Netflix, and Zoom. You know, as you know, the Zoom went down yesterday in the, in the U.S. East Coast, and Zoom utilizes the cloud technology to to harness all these uh, different kind of computing resources. So you can imagine how these things, these technologies that contributed to <clears throat> the fundamental science like high energy particle physics can be going out to the everyday lives. And this is exactly what, what we are doing. I mean, we're doing this because, you know, the, the side effect of the high energy particle physics, the technology can make everyday lives better. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so why is high energy physics relevant to me? And we're getting close to the end of it. Um, you know, high energy physics explores the most fundamental nature of the universe, okay? So did we discover is we'll realize our 1,000 year dreams, at least my 1,000 year dreams. And the discovery of the dark matter and making the dark matter beams will take us to the next, um, you know, next quantum level. So here is what I am working on now. Um, now that the Higgs discovery, you know, Higgs particle was discovered, which is, you know, only my, my part of the 5% of the universe. It's time for us to look into 95%. Of course, there are other people who've been already looking into it directly, but I want to look at it using the beam. That's the idea behind this. Okay, so there are you know, uh, theories that can give us the dark matter in the fire state like this, where quark anti-quark comes in, annihilated photons, and photons somehow couples, magically couples to dark photons and giving out um, dark matter or the similar fashion, but you know, these decays of the particles when the low energy happens. So detection of a, you know, um, dark matter is in the reverse direction where a car, the dark matter comes in, kicks out an electron, a dark matter comes in, kicks out a nucleon, and you detect these electrons and nucleons. So how does the dark, dark matter event look like in an experiment? It looks like this, where you have high point intensity proton beam comes in, and then it gives out, um, it gives out pions, which generates neutrinos, and then, of course, it also gives the guy the dark matter. And so you can actually detect them in the dark matter amongst all these neutrino interactions, okay? Now, neutrinos are backgrounds to dark matter. They look exactly like the dark matter. So we can actually use, um, you know, beamline that can separate neutrinos and antineutrinos from dark matter using string of magnets. And that was the, uh, that was the idea that I proposed about seven years ago, and I haven't done anything about it. It's just uh, the idea. Uh, again, and given the parent particle of neutrinos, a magnetic kick, you know, this, so parent particle of neutrinos are charged mesons, so you can actually use that and give a magnetic pep, uh, magnetic kick, and you use a dipole after the mesons are fully focused. So you have proton comes in, neutrino target, and there is a focusing horn because you have to capture as many low energy particles as possible. You can have a dipole that will give a kick um, that will get the neutrino dark of the, the neutral particles go straight on to the beam dump 
followed by a high precision detector. And you know, the, the charged particles, charged mesons, which gives neutrinos, then get directed to the neutrino experiment. So the same facility can serve as a dark matter experiment and you, you know, precision neutrino experiment. And that's, the, that's my dream. But this dipole is actually, this is my second 1,000 dream, as I told you. But this dipole is a, is a very complicated dipole. So, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so that's that. And of course, the outcome and byproduct of high energy research improves our daily lives directly and indirectly. Worldwide, wide, worldwide web came, fr came from the high energy physics, as you know. So these are my two students, undergraduate students that I, I sent them out to uh, CERN to do the construction of that field cage. And this is where the plaque is, where the web was born, not too far from the main building of the um, of CERN. Okay, there you go. All right. And then of course, you know, in doing this, we have to develop a, you know, advanced detector technologies that detect and sensors that don't exist before. We use, um, you know, I've been working on the GEM gas electromultiplier technology to detect, to develop a de sensitive detector like this. Yes, this is a, actually a prototype detector, um, you know, with an X-ray shining from on top with, with something, um, some, you know, a stuff right in the middle at the top of the detector. What do you think what this is? Can you actually tell what this is? This is an X-ray image of something. Mm -hmm. Anybody? How about software rendering like this? Oh, come on, guys. Don't be shy. The, the uh, head points, at the, I mean the cross-section of your detector or something. I don't know. No, it's simpler than that. It's this. Can you see the resemblance now? Yes. Okay. All right. So there, that's how you do it. So are we done with the computing grid? Not at all, at all. LSC has performed very well and let's see, you know, computing grid has really well and data size will increase by tenfold now, but, you know, soon, uh, probably hundredfold in, uh, in, you know, uh, high luminosity LSC. So computing will be under even more stress. And so grid computing infrastructure has served us well so far. And you know there were a huge number of Atlas and CMS users and petabytes and of data and billions of jobs that are processed. But the high intensity experiments like Dune also could record much more, you know, even large amount of uh, as much or even large amount of data. As I told you, Dune is large and there is uh, it requires precision, um, you know, uh, data taking. And also, it should be able to take data for those cosmic particles that are flying in any time. So that, that means that we have to be able to, you know, take all this data in a smart way. And, you know, we have to, you know, we have uh, identified limits in database uh, scalability and CPU resources, storage utilization, and, and stuff like that are being addressed at this point. So we have identified already, even before the LSC was, uh, was shut down to do the high luminosity LSC preparation. And um, we are actually going into the computing already ahead of time. So planning for high energy physics and, you know, and utilizing um, you know, uh, quantum computing and the machine learning technologies are happening in, in high energy physics area. And so there is huge amount of, uh, resources that are being put in for computing, okay? So in conclusion, in the quest of origin of, universe, of the universe, um, high energy physics uses you know, accelerators to look into the smallest possible um, distance and uses large detectors to ex explore nature and unveil secrets of the universe. We use large number of computers to process data in a timely fashion Large amount of data sets, uh, you know, gets to be accumulated and computing grid has performed marvelously and, and for the expeditious data analysis. Okay, high energy physics is uh, an exciting endeavor, as you can see, you know, it's something that, you know, if you just start talk, talking about how, you know, tall particles making up the entire universe, you feel like, that, my God, these guys are walking in the cloud. But no, it's not just walking in the cloud. We are looking at something that's looking far, far down the road, not just tomorrow, but you know, a lot farther. 
Okay, and physics analysis at you know one's own desktop using computing grids, you know, sitting behind has happened. Yeah, and uh, computing grid ne needed for you know other disciplines with large data. So you know, as you can see these days, the meteor meteorological, the weather forecast is much more precise and down to few you know few hours. Yeah, and computing grid is now outside of the high energy physics um, realm and into everyday lives we would not have been able to talk to uh, each other like this over Zoom, okay? Although Zoom cannot replace face-to-face, -face, um, you know, it actually gives us some means of communicating with each other. And, you know, true computing grid is revolutionizing everyday lives at this point. But in the parting statement, I want to make sure that we all share this. Let's all dream and not just for tomorrow, or not even just for the next year. Let's all dream thousand years down into the future for the whole humanity. That's the you know, Matt last message that I want to give. Thank you very much for listening. I'm done, Kiteri. Yes, Jay. Thank you very, very much for this uh, comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the importance of high performance computing and grid uh, distributed computing for success of uh, high energy physics. Um, more people have questions. Are there more questions or comments? Okay. Okay, uh, Saeed, please go ahead. Yeah. Good day, everyone. Prof, thank you very much for the insightful lecture. That was a mind blowing one. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, by the way, there is a food for thought. So go ahead, go ahead, Syed. Yeah. Okay, I've got I've got a couple of questions. So yeah, I'll probably I will just read out the questions and you could attend to them. Um, number one, I want to confirm something. This experiment, like the drone experiment, which is carried out underground. So I want to know: is there like does the experiment in any way does it affect the continental shelf or the sea planes? That's one. And number two, like. The seismic wave underground. And the next one, talking about the quest of the quest of the origin of the universe. Is it just the duty of high energy physicists to provide answers to that or people like archaeologists and how does it come in as well? Okay. I think those are so, my questions for now. Right. Thank okay, you. good. Thank you for the question. I, I just could not hear the last part of the first question. What was the last part of the first question? Uh, that was the most important part that, uh, that my mind. The first question yeah. was that. Hello, I, can, I can't yeah, hear you. Experiment, man. Yeah. They are carried out on the ground. Yeah. The drone experiment. The drone experiment. Yeah. Okay, you, you're breaking off. So, so um, your question is, why do we do it underground? Experiments carried up underground, planes out of the ocean. Experiment carried out underground is uh, is doing something bad to the earth? Uh, yeah, Ketebi, did you hear what he said? I think maybe the question is why the experiments are underground. Uh, but Wait, Saeed, you, you want to type the question because we couldn't just see. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably, I will type the questions in. I will type them yeah, in. Yeah. I will type them in. There. Okay. Right. I think that that will be helpful because uh, you know, you're you. So in the meantime, uh, other people have uh, yeah. questions or comments. Okay, there is another yeah. hand raise or comments. Okay. Uh, uh, no. Okay, that is not a question. Um, anybody okay. wants uh, have questions? So, uh, Mohammed uh, Zazua from. Uh, from uh, yeah. Morocco. Could you comment on how the grid is working for you there in Morocco? Uh, so for Panda, it's working uh, very well. Sometimes, you know, you get these messages that, uh, for example, like the, the last one that we worked, worked in. <coughs> so to, uh, to not stress, the message was about to not stress uh, the job. Uh, do not loop too much to exhaust the resource. 
otherwise I worked with it uh, for my uh, qualification task and uh, running with very huge uh, Monte Carlo samples and uh, it was uh, uh, very helpful and uh, and easy. So yeah, we should point out that uh, uh, you know there is uh, a great computing center in in Morocco uh, who has been in Atlas uh, for many years since two thousand one. So there is a huge uh, particle physics, high energy physics community there, and they have uh, they have a very nice working grid center. Uh, so Mohammed is uh, getting his PhD on Atlas uh, with uh, Professor mm -hmm. Farid Fassi. And mm. he's also working with me on Higgs to Invisible. Uh, so mm. um, so he's, he's there in, in, uh, in, uh, in Morocco and, and he's using the grids to, to analyze uh, Atlas data. Um, we also know that in South Africa, there is uh, uh, good uh, computing resources. Anybody from there wants to comment? I don't see any of uh, Simon Connell's students connected today, uh, the, which is unfortunately who have been able to comment. Um, so in terms of high energy uh, physics computing, those are the two centers, uh, well, in Atlas. I think perhaps Egypt also has a great computing center for CMS. Anybody from Egypt want to comment? Srinam Varma, you want to comment? Yeah, uh, am I audible? Yes, please Hello. go ahead. Uh, can I have, ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, Graf Nehron, uh, sir, can we use uh, neutrino particles for the, as a source uh, in high energy physics? Yeah. Hello. As a source for? Uh, in uh, high energy physics, can we use geo neutrinos uh, such as radioactive nuclides uh, for the source creating the high energy particle collision? Oh yeah, it could. <clears throat> so um, there are neutrinos coming in, you know, from uh, from the universe, and um, and their cross section. In other words, the probability of interacting is very low, but it is non-zero. So, and the, the higher the neutrino energy, the higher the probability. So it is possible that high, very high energy neutrinos coming from, for example, supernova explosion could come in and, you know, hit the nucleus in the earth or, you know, in summer in, uh, and when we're leaving here um, and, and, you know, create very high energy particles. But those are very rare. So therefore, even if it happens, it doesn't have, you know, any uh, v visible, you know, um, impact. Uh, is there any side effects of uh, collision those in your geo particles? Any side effect? I see. Because well, the so, earth so, itself, so. the earth itself holds a lot of geo neutrinos inside the crust mantle and core. So is oh, there you're, any, yeah. you're, yes, you're asking if there is a lot of geo neutrinos coming out? Yes. Is there well, any uh, probability or possibility? Right. So, so inside the Earth, there is, um, you know, not very high level of, um, you know, nuclear interactions like the ones that are happening in the sun. In the sun. And, uh, and so therefore, the amount of uh, geo neutrinos that are coming out is not large. And on top of that, um, the neutrinos, those neutrinos coming from nuclear interactions are very low energy. So all those that are coming from the sun, which is the dominant one, they actually come in billions and billions at a time per square centimeters. Okay, so they're passing through about 50 billion per um, second per square centimeter. But but they're not doing anything because their energy is very low and their probability is very low. So in the scale of a human being, it doesn't have, you know, um, visible adverse effect. Did I answer you correctly? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, so uh, Syed asked, uh, the experiment carried out on the ground, um, do they in any way have adverse effect on the continental shelves or ocean plains? Well, so uh, in order for, the, first of all, the um, uh, dark matter experiment, especially Dune, not dark matter, the neutrino experiment, the Dune, is in South Dakota, which is pretty far away from, you know, from the sea. But on top of that, its depth is only 1,500 meters. Okay, so the impact to the, um, uh, these um, geographical uh, structure is, uh, is very minimal. And also, we, you know, when we are locating these experiments, we try to avoid any adverse effect on them. Second question was that, does a seismic wave uh, really affect the ob observations of those underground experiments? I mean, they could, um, when they're happening, their data, the data taken during that period may have a different kind of effect. You would see those effects because the positions measured because the detector will be, you know, vibrating or the positions are moving. But in the scale of neutrino experiments, especially the far detector in South Dakota, those uh, movement is going to be, you know, not dramatic. And also these seismic waves, you know, are not always happening, right? So it only happens at a, you know, localized time period. So therefore the, the effect of these guys can be, you know, uh, minimal, okay? And now there was uh, another question about this nuclear power plant and how do we generate electricity from nuclear power plant, right? Somebody asked that. Who was this? Um, Toivo? Toivo asked this question. Okay, so let me tell you how it happens, okay? So um, here. <clears throat> so how does a nuclear power plant work? So the way that nuclear power plant works, I'm, I'm simplifying it, right? So, so you have a reactor vessel where you have nuclear fuel rod in it. And these fuel rods are shot with some, you know, slow neut neutrons that will cause a nuclear breakup, okay? That's exactly the same kind of principle as, um, as, the, as the atomic bomb. And when the nuclear breakup happens, energy gets released. When energy gets released, so here is the energy release. When energy, energy gets released, the energy is, you know, sort of directed toward water tank so that it can, you know, boil the water, generate steam. And this steam is then gets pushed to the turbine. You know, turbine will be then pushed and, and rotate around. And that end of that turbine is the generator that has a magnet with the coils around that are, that are you know, surrounded like this. So therefore, Turning turbine will turn the magnet and therefore it will generate electricity. You've learned this in your um, introductory physics class. So uh, that principle is still the same. The point I'm making here is that despite the fact that we use very advanced technology to generate energy, we, uh, energy capturing is very, very old and archaic. And it's the, um, um, it's the um, uh, steam engine uh, technology, and therefore these process is inherently very dangerous. Over here is less dangerous, but this part is very dangerous. So if we don't have to do it like this, we can somehow make the nucleus somehow doing it and going directly to the electricity. Um, that would be much better, right? So that's the point. Toivo, is that, is that good? Okay. Yes, sir. And that, all right, very good, thank you. Okay, now here is another question that says, how do Dune experiments detect neutrinos? Of, as far as I know, they don't leave any tracks on the detector. You're absolutely right, because the neutrinos do not actually interact as often. They do interact, it's just that their probability of interaction is very, very low. So. So that's the reason why you have to have, you have to have um, high intensity neutrino beams, okay? And, uh, and then you have to have a large amount of material in the path of it. So that some of those neutrinos will interact, okay? So the, when neutrino interaction happens, it looks just like this. You have nothing coming in and then suddenly blop, blop happens. And, uh, and, you know, um, so that's, uh, that's how you can actually 
um, detect neutrinos. Okay. Um, and when you treat it, yeah. You know, Mary Bishai gave uh, two lectures just before you yeah. on the ah, okay. on, on neutrinos, and and she went over this. Uh, I guess the person who asked the question was did not follow those lectures, but yeah. Okay. Anyways, yeah, you can give them again the synopsis. Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's why you need to have very high intensity neutrino beam in order to um, proton beams in order to generate um, high flux neutrino beam. Okay. Let me see. Anybody else? Is there, did I miss there was a chat window? Somehow my chat window disappeared. Hang on. Yeah. No. The, it would be best if the for the questions you send it to everybody because i didn't i think some of the questions were sent to you on privately jay uh, no i uh, at least those have been sent to everybody i think i don't see i only see some really hey, uh, syed, syed had a few more questions syed you had a third question in the quest of explaining the origin of the universe or um, where we come from, is it only high energy physics responsibility or is uh, has, has to be done in conjunction with other science, uh, fields like archaeology and others? Well, I mean, archaeology can give us some ideas as well. Uh, but, you know, um, what we're trying to figure out is that at the very beginning of the universe, we didn't have the earth like this. Archaeology requires earth. So, what we do is that we actually combine all these different kind of knowledges, okay? But, but it has to be as, as fundamental as possible. Archaeology can provide the information about the history after the Earth's existence. And, uh, and you know, we are going actually beyond the Earth. So um, it could provide some information, but not as much. Of course, other areas like, um, like you know, astrophysics are something that will provide us you know, very important information. So in, in your general regard, yes, we, we have to have um, done this study in conjunction with other areas as well. If yes, are there any form of collaboration between the concerned field? Yes, um, with, uh, with, you know, um, the high energy physics area you know, collaborates with the um, astronomy and astrophysics uh, quite often because we develop all these um, you know, uh, technologies and, and astrophysics can use all these technologies together. Okay. All right, so uh, let's get uh, two more questions and then we stop. I, I appreciate questions related uh, to uh, the high performance computing and their use in particle physics as uh, has been uh, presented by uh, uh, Dr. J. Yu here. Uh, there are some other questions which are interesting, but uh, let's, can we keep the discussion focused on the topic of today? Yeah, okay. Hi, Kishi. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have uh, one more question. Okay. Yes, I'm uh, So it's uh, not uh, a question, but I need uh, a comment from you about, so the LHC as, uh, is doing now in Nepograde, so we will have uh, like uh, the luminosity greater about 1,000 times. Uh, so there is upgrade for the de for the different detector, the Atlas, MS, and all the others. So actually, I'm I want to know what what is uh, the upgrade on uh, on the grid for Panda, for example. Is it like uh, building more uh, uh, more storage or uh, or something else? Well, how how, <laughs> how, how the uh, the grid will deal with uh, the huge data that will consequence from the the upgrade? Upgrade. Oh, Yes, so I guess the question is with the upgrade of the detector coming up, do we have a plan to upgrade the computing systems as well to deal with the much more increased data volume that is expected? Yes, 
Um, actually, the, the upgrading the computing system, both software and the hardware, including the network, um, has been in the works, uh, you know, even before the end of the first round of, um, of the data taking, because we do expect, uh, you know, these um, upgrades of the uh, high luminosity happens. And so, um, so the implementation of those um, is uh, happening. And if you want a detail, I, I, I can look it up and, and find it for you. But, uh, but you know, in general, uh, those things are happening at the same time as the detector upgrade. So one last question or comment. There was, uh, some, there was something in the uh, chat, actually. There were two somethings. One is from Yasin. How do dune experiment detect neutrinos? No, but you as answered as that I, already. Okay, I've done that, okay. Now, the yeah, other one is... Uh, I'm, I have a yeah. uh, question on the uh, your uh, proposed idea of uh, replacing the nuclear uh, uh, factories or the... Uh, hang on a second, hang on a second. Okay, um, it looks like that my next appointment is coming up, so um, we're going to have to wrap this up. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Mohammed, you were, you were asking one urgent question. What was that? Uh, I was asking uh, if you can uh, elaborate on your idea of uh, replacing the uh, nuclear power uh, plants. Oh, one, no, yeah. I cannot. I mean, you know, because uh, as I said, that, that takes thousand years. And the reason why it takes thousand years is because the fact that, that, you know, we only know the principle. And if we first have to prove that all the forces have been united as one at the very beginning of the universe. Once we know that, then, then we know that we can go from nuclear force to electricity directly. That we know in principle, right? How do yeah. we make that happen is uh, it's going to take a while because it requires a lot of engineering. All yeah. right. So on that note, yeah. I will suggest that we, we stop. You can contact uh, Professor J.U. Uh, if you need to. And uh, when we have the term school um, after COVID-19, we'll have the pleasure to have him present at the school again, just like in the past. Um, so we'll be seeing much of him again in the future. So on the behalf right. of everybody, thanks a lot. And uh, see you next time. Nice Bye -bye. to meet you. Bye. I hope it helped. Yeah, it was useful. Thanks, Jay. Okay, bye-bye.